Well, hey, welcome everybody. I want to welcome all of you at all our locations, those of you joining us online. My name is Robert. I'm the teaching pastor here, and we are continuing a series called You Asked For It. And I have with me a friend, guest speaker, Sam Collier. He's going to be uh, sharing some stuff with us. A little backstory uh, from, from Sam. Sam and I, we did, a, we did a camp for our students a couple years ago, and, and Sam's doing a lot of incredible things. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, a couple things I wrote down as, as we were talking that you got going on. Sam is an international speaker. Uh, he's the director of city strategy for Orange, which is the curriculum we use for our students and our kids at Sun Valley. And, and that curriculum is influencing over two and a half million kids across the country. Sam's a, a, a big part of that. You launched a company, the diverseleader.com uh, or diverseleader.com, and you're, you're consulting with churches as well as corporate entities. Sam's worked closely with the King family, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter, Bernice, and, and that family. He's worked closely with them and helping uh, bring diversity and, and awareness across the country. You have the Greater Story podcast now in over 100 million homes. You have a book that you're releasing next year. So in the last two years since you and I did this camp together, man, you have just taken off, and I am doing the exact same thing I was doing. <laughs> two years ago, uh, but, but so excited to have you joining us, Sam. Thank you so much for, for being here with us. Well, man, you're up on the wall. You're like Nehemiah, right? You're not yeah. coming down. G give it up for Robert. Come on, give it oh, up for Oh, come him. on now. No. He's, what you're doing is eternal. It's amazing. And while you've been doing it, you've been able to keep the Mohawk. Would you call wow. it a Mohawk? No, it's not called a Mohawk, okay? It's... What would you call it? Hey, Sam, let's dive right in here. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's change the subject. So I want to start with this question. Uh, and, and I didn't ask him to, uh, to, to highlight me. Thanks, Sam, for, for no, giving me a little love there. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I do want us to, to hear a little bit. You and I were talking today and, and a little bit of your, your backstory. I mean, you, yeah. you have an incredible story, a powerful story. And I know that's the content of, of your book that, that you're working on right now. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your story and, and where you grew up, where you were born and, and where you were uh, raised. Yeah, I am. Um, my publisher won't let me share as much as I want to share, but I'm going to tell you some things. So if you guys don't tell anybody that we talked about it, then that would be good. Um, the book is called A Greater Story, but it's called A Greater Story because it's based on the idea that when your story connects to God's story, it leads to a greater story, mm -hmm. something greater. And so all throughout my life, I think there have been moments in which God um, connected our stories uh, to his. And there were people in my life that stepped in in critical moments um, in which we needed a miracle. And, you know, I have a twin sister. We got adopted at two months raised, or let me, let me say it this way, um, our mother was 21 when she had us. She had three kids already, so that's five kids, age 21. Welfare, poverty, dad left the picture. He was addicted to crack. And she didn't have enough money to, ca to take care of the three kids she already had, so here she is in the hospital with two more. And so she decided to give us up for adoption, and we were in need of a miracle, man. Uh, we didn't know, I mean, obviously, I'm two months, uh, I wasn't really alive, but I was. Um, but we were in need of a miracle in that moment because we were entering into the foster care system. And we know the stats about mm -hmm. foster care and kids that grow up in that and didn't know if anybody would come and rescue us. And we got adopted uh, by a couple that had just given their life to Christ. They came down from D.C. to Augusta, Georgia, walked in and said, we want the two twins. But the lady who was running the agency said, no, you don't want them. They're probably not going to be much because of where they came from. And so um, our parents prayed and said, no, we do. There's something about them. God led them. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of the moments in which, you know, they put their wills down to pick up God's will mm -hmm. um, and maybe even the will of another to pick up God's will. And that's how their story was able to connect to God's and it led to a greater story. And so, and they saw something in you that, that yeah. maybe this lady or, or people in society, they didn't see, yeah. uh, but they, they saw something. Totally. And my sister, you know, she got all A's from kindergarten up to 12th grade and dual scholarship to Spelman, Georgia Tech. She's an industrial engineer, and I'm here with you. Mm -hmm. And the Mohawk. Yes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel like, you know, God, God really, he did a miracle. But I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, on the streets of Arvin Avenue where the civil rights movement took place. Every time we would go, you know, my dad had a barbershop on Auburn, and 
I would see the King Center, Martin Luther King Jr. Center every Saturday. I would yeah. see murals of John Lewis and just grew up in this environment um, in which black excellence was starting to become a thing. That um, th th there was this idea that we had come uh, through an oppressive state, mm -hmm. but that we could overcome. Mm -hmm. And so we would learn about Harriet Tubman and we would learn about Maya Angelou and we would see murals about John Lewis and, and Dr. King and hear his words. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you've ever been to the King Center, but if you walk on the grounds, you have the tomb of Martin Luther King Jr. and now his wife right next to them. And you can hear his voice coming through loudspeakers on, on the property. Mm -hmm. And that was my childhood. And so it's a little bit about me. So you have this history with the Martin Luther King Jr. and, and the civil rights movement. Yeah. And in the 60s, you have laws that are now changed. And you have the end of Jim Crow segregation. And you have that that happened in our country. Yeah. And so legally, there was a shift that happened when it comes to, uh, to racism in our country. But yeah. even though there were some legal changes, there, there's still this undercurrent yeah. that exists in America. Now, now, help us understand and explain yeah. uh, how racism is still alive in America today. But you know, one of the things that um, Martin Luther King Jr. used to say is that you cannot legislate morality. Mm -hmm. You can't legislate it. We can change laws all day, but you can't make somebody love somebody. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we would see, even though voting had been passed, that it was now legal for black people to vote and for minorities to vote for all, um, you, you still found these loopholes that people were creating to still oppress us in some way. So, for instance, hey, in order to qualify, here's a jar of massive jelly beans. Tell me how many is in this jar. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, how am I supposed to know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, I want you to recite the entire, con you know, Constitution. It's mm -hmm. like, come on. Yeah. So there was just these, all of these loopholes. And so what, it, that's a really microcosm, you know, a small story or a view, a picture that grew into something bigger of what happened over the next kind of 50 years. Because it was about 50 years ago that that happened where you find America doing um, what it what it needs to do to try to fix this issue, but you have these people that are still holding on to their old ideals, even though the laws have changed. And so that's when you experience, even today, some what people would refer to as institutional racism mm -hmm. and uh, prejudice based on whatever, and, you know. And so through the, that's a long way of saying the laws were set, but there were loopholes that were always being created within. And the, and the reality of, in America, so you have laws that were changed, but you still have the cycle of poverty, and, yeah. and you have divisions of communities, and you have people who don't have the same access to education, to work. You were yeah. talking about, um, you grew up in a home that, that was middle class. Yeah. Uh, you weren't, as in your own words, you weren't living in the hood, but you were hood adjacent. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. As, <laughs> as you said it. Yeah, hood adjacent, it just means um, the hood is two streets over. Yeah. So I wasn't quite there, but, uh, you know. And, and, and talk about the situation for those who are in that community. And, and you mentioned, you know, they, they weren't able to drive to some of the jobs or have transportation and some of the same opportunities uh, that maybe some people would take for granted yeah. and go, I thought everybody could get an education or get a job or, or do whatever and just, you know, yeah. work their way out of that, that situation. And that's yeah. not the case in, in a lot of America. Yeah. I mean, you know, the America we live in now is 50 years removed from oppression and then obviously we have 400 years of slavery. And so when you look at the wealth gap in our country, you know, the average black family is making $30,000 a year, the average white family 100,000. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that, you start to ask the question, well, why is that? How did that happen? Is it because white people work harder? Is it because black people aren't smart? I mean, is it because minorities? And it's none of that. What it really is, is it's this, it's, we're living in this time in which we're playing catch up from so many years. I mean, just, just imagine this. You talk about four to 500 years of oppression in which one race has um, profited. And so what happens is that race is now living in the result of the history that their ancestors created. The same way that our race is now living in the history um, that our ancestors lived in. So what does that mean? It means multi-generational wealth that's con an opportunity and access to knowledge and reading. And we couldn't read for such a long time, you know what I'm saying? They yeah. didn't want us to read, uh, but many of our white brothers and sisters could. So you imagine a race that can read for 400 to 500 years, and then we finally pick it up, and then we're learning about 
economics, and we're learning about capitalism, and then we're learning about, okay, I, now I can go to school, and I can go to college, and now my family is able to have a little bit of money, but, and so that's how you end up with 100,000 being an average and 30,000. And so it's just, it's just the effects that we're living in based on what happened in, the, you know, in history. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and, and you mentioned something, and we were having a conversation and, and Sam, you've, you've had a, a lot of uh, great success in a lot of different areas, very yeah. entrepreneurial, pursuing a lot of different things, yeah. uh, staying up, you know, all hours of the night, right. writing and, and working on all kinds of things. Yeah. And, and you, you've experienced a lot of successes along the way. Yeah. And, uh, and you were describing to me uh, that, that you began to learn things as you kind of crossed over from one culture into another culture. Yeah. And you, you talked about an ecosystem yeah. uh, that you didn't know existed and, and, and that you also had to learn some new cultural things. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that and kind of what your experience has been. Yeah, there. so um, I grew up, obviously, in Atlanta. Um, they call it kind of the black mecca of the South. And my childhood was just filled with nothing but blackness. I grew up, I was in a black neighborhood. I had black teachers, maybe one or two white teachers that were brave enough to come. Um, black church, black, 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 black. And, and so I started working at a 25,000 member African American church. I was over young adults down um, uh, middle school, college, all these other things. And we went through a scandal. And the church dropped from 25,000 down to 3,000 in a year. Wow. Unbelievable. CNN was at the church every Sunday. And I was in, uh, I was in a massive leadership role there. Well, I almost gave up on the faith after I left that ministry. It took me about a year to believe really in the church again. Someone said to me, you need to go see about what Andy Stanley is doing. And I said, who in the world is Andy Stanley? Mm -hmm. and, and, and for those who don't know who Andy Stanley is, he's a mega church pastor in, a, in Atlanta. Uh, a lot of pastors learn a lot from Andy Stanley. He's been around yeah. doing, doing he's, things. He's Charles Stanley's son. For, yeah. that's, that's how most people know him. Like, oh, yeah. I know Charles, I don't know Andy. You all, know, the, all the boomers were like, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> Charles, Charles Stanley. Okay. Yeah, and so I stumble into one of the North Point campuses, which is up under the leash of Andy Stanley. And... I had never seen so many white people in a room. Mm -hmm. It was like the Christian gap. <laughs> and I was like, what is happening? This is crazy. And so, uh, and again, you, you gotta understand, I'm coming from this all black, you know. And so I was so amazed at the lights and the intentionality. And I mean, you know, you go to this church, this church is, um, it's intentional about it. And, and I, I just, I never knew you could present Jesus in this way. And, and at the black church that I was at there, we had bells and we had lights and all the whistles, but it was just on a different level. It was like the Grammys on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so I was so blown away. I was attracted. I said, I need to learn uh, more about this. Long story short, started a nonprofit that was in the inner city. We reached about 100,000 uh, kids in the inner city in a year. Dr. Bernice King, Monty King's daughter, started endorsing what we were doing. A friend of mine from uh, Andy Stanley's church who became my first white friend ever in life after that first night that I was just running around trying to talk to any white person that would talk to me about what the heck this is. And we went to eat for like the next uh, year, every month for about four hours. And he would ask me every question about black people he had. And I would ask him every question about white people that I had. And so we built this relationship, started this nonprofit, invited him on the board. He says, I need to bring Andy Stanley down to see about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I said, well, don't just bring Andy down for me. Let me bring Bernice down. Let's, let's not waste this opportunity. So I met Andy, introducing him to the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. From there, I joined North Point Ministries and I was really the first of my kind in that organization. And I don't mean black, I mean from a Pentecostal kind of, you know, civil rights kind of background. And in order for me to be relevant in that system, I had to now learn about white people. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I wanted to be valuable. I wanted to actually help. And you know, in ministry, if you don't understand, um, and I'm going to use the word clientele just from a business perspective, if you don't understand the clientele that, that's happening, if you don't understand what's happening in their culture and the different things they're dealing with, you can't minister effectively. So what that ended up being is me submitting myself to white culture and getting white friends and interviewing all types of white people as long as I, and I learned a lot about white people. So educate us. <laughs> Well, what, we, what, what were some of the cultural differences yeah. that you walked in and you went, this, this is not like yeah. what, I, what I'm used to? Well, you know, the dancing was one. <laughs> that was the first one. I said, wow, 
there really isn't that much rhythm over here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I had heard about it, but, um, and then I said, man, white people love Mexican food. Because every time <laughs> we would, I would show up, they're like, we got Mexican. I'm like, why do we keep eating Mexican food? And everywhere we went, I, obviously I learned about the gap, but then I also learned, learned about Old Navy. <laughs> and then I learned about The Bachelor. Shout out to the, the white ladies. And, <laughs> You know, I started learning. See, we got some Bachelor <laughs> fans in the building. Um, that, I, I, that's when I learned about the group Journey. I didn't know what that you was. You'd never heard Journey all, before. All, I just, I was at a camp yeah. one day and somebody was just a small town. I was like, what is that? <laughs> Next thing you know, people got their phones out the lights. I said, what is this, the anthem? I mean, what, <laughs> just the white anthem? And so I just started learning different things um, about that culture. And, and it was, it was, you know, it was, I, it was good for me. Friends, y'all like friends, the show, yeah. right? yeah. Friends is a good thing, you know, so shout out to white people. All right. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for educating us all on that. We appreciate that. That was um, good. So, so you noticed some cultural differences. You, you also observed, uh, and, and I think you began to understand more clearly what institutional racism was. Explain, because yeah. you used that phrase that yeah. kind of in passing. Explain to us what institutional racism is. Yeah. Um, I want to pause just for a second to piggyback on what we just said. Mm -hmm. Just as we're being kind of led in the spirit in this moment and, and, and then answer the question and say, the other thing that I learned about white people was that they weren't all racist. And that was big for me because I was coming from a narrative that taught me that they were. Mm -hmm. And so as I was learning about their culture and about the kind of crazy things that y'all do in love, I also learned um, that I could trust white people and that if we got to know each other, that we, we, could, we could create a new narrative. And within that, as I submitted myself to this culture while still holding on to my own culture, I started to understand institutional racism and what that really means on a very practical level. And, and, this is, and, and I don't want to speak for every single person in America, but I want to speak on the level of a majority because being able to consult so many different organizations and um, colleges and churches about this topic and having now becoming friends with, de with decision makers that happen to be white and, ha and we start having this conversation, I started to really understand how this thing continues to happen. And it really is more unintentional than it is intentional which is why it's so difficult to solve because nobody's waking up. And I don't want to say nobody, but not many people are waking up going, I'm going to oppress this people group. And, uh, yeah. you know, in the 60s, it was really easy to fight racism because you could see it. Yeah. Black restroom, white restroom, you know. Yeah. Black people sit up here, white people sit back here. You, it was very easy to see. But in now, in today's time, it's difficult because it's kind of hidden and we're kind of living, again, we talk about history in the history and the effects of history. So, which means that we could be perpetuating a cycle that we didn't start. And so institutional racism looks like this today. It looks like a lot of ways, but this is one of the greatest ways. I was consulting um, a majority white organization. Love this organization. The CEO came to me and said, we gotta, we gotta change this. We want this organization to be diverse. We have been white for a long time. We don't think white is just right. We want to embrace the kingdom of God. And we want to create something that highlights all people and welcomes all people and shows love to all people. This is in the South. And so for four years, we're knocking at this thing. Mm -hmm. And we look at marketing. Okay, what, what does our marketing look like? You know, so we went from all white faces on a document to now, you know, 30, 30, 30, and it's like, okay, now we're switching this up. Then we went to our products, and we said, okay, if we've got, uh, if we're doing this, okay, we got to change this, we got to bring this in, and we're 30, 30, 30 again. It's like, man, we're, we're killing it. The last piece for us was the staff. We have been, and I, what I want to punctuate again is we've been knocking at this for four years. The entire organization knew that we needed to move in this way. Everybody wanted it. Nobody was against it. We were all waving the flag. We introduced eight new staff members in a day. Eight after four years, and they stood them up one by one, and every single one was white. So I'm in the crowd going, oh, what are we going to do? 
everybody's gonna be so disappointed. They're gonna be, I gotta, I, so I'm like, I gotta go around and make my rounds and let everybody know it's gonna be okay. We, you know, and so I start, you know, going to department to department going, guys, I, did you see it? Are you, are y'all okay? Did you see it? And they said, see what? Hmm. I said, did you see it? Did you see it? All the, the staff members were white that we stood, and they said, they were? I said, yes, you didn't say, they said, oh my gosh, they were. So then they're hurting, they're like, how did this happen? So I go to the next, I'm like, you know, maybe that was just that person. I'm gonna go to the next department. I said, did you see it? Did you see it? See what? After about five of those conversations, <laughs> I realized they didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And so then I started asking the question to the departments that hired, because out of these eight staff members, there were different departments that hired each one. Mm -hmm. And I said, how did you make your decision on who you were hiring? They said, well, it wasn't intentional. We just, we had to get the role filled. We wanted to hire people that, you know, we trusted, that kind of understood our language. And so we just pulled out our phone and started texting people. Mm -hmm. We went through our emails and started emailing people. So in other words, they went to their immediate circle. And their circle was all white. All white. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening is we hired all white people and didn't know it. It wasn't intentional. But what it created was the lack of opportunity for minorities that aren't in that print circle. And so when we talk about institutional racism, what it looks like is this. Some of the largest organizations and most successful organizations in our country are led by white individuals, and they've been led by white individuals for a very long time. Why? Because white people have been in power for a very long time. And so if you as a white individual is, are, are in power for a very long time, and the primary way that you hire people is based on the circles that you have, and you continue to hire people that are in your friend group, and then they hire people that are in their friend group, you look up and you have an all-white company, and you didn't intentionally leave minorities out, but you didn't intentionally break the system in the cycle that you naturally floated into to bring them in. That's institutional racism. And I want to I want to dive in just real quick to to help us understand the, the more research I've done on the history of racism and, and how we got here as, as a country. It's really uh, it's really deeply ingrained into the foundations yeah. of our nation, which I think is is difficult for a lot of us to admit. Um, that, that this country in many ways was founded on a lot of racist ideologies. Yeah. That, that we hold this, these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal didn't mean all men. Right. Um, that, 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 that was specifically talking about white, land-owning, uh, not female, uh, that there was a, there was a lot of uh, baggage attached to that language. And, and so even though, again, legally things have changed, there's still a lot of roots of that in the system where those who are in power continue to hand power off to people who look like them, talk like them culturally or similar. Yeah. And, and that has continued e yeah. even though legally that's not the case in America. Yeah. Um, and, and as I researched the roots of, of this racism, it's important to understand, a few weeks ago I, I talked about uh, understanding what narrative we're in. And, and, and meaning, what, what is the story of us? How did we get to where we're at? And, and there's been a couple competing narratives. There's the narrative of scripture, and, and there's the narrative of our culture. And in the last couple hundred years, the narrative of our, of our culture has reinforced racism, uh, not necessarily intentionally, but there's been this narrative that, that you and I, we, we evolved from goo. And a couple hundred years ago with Darwinian evolution theory and all of that, uh, there have been writers, there was a guy, uh, Gobineau, who was a French aristocrat, uh, took that same thinking and he wrote an essay on the inequality of human races saying that there are uh, ranks to humanity, that we evolved and some people are further evolved, some people are further ahead, and, and went through and said people who are from this region are at the bottom of the scale, people from this region and the Caucasian region, uh, they would be at the top, Nazi Germany. Uh, took that mentality and we got the Holocaust born out of that same narrative yeah. of saying, hey, we're going to create a super race, an Aryan race. And they, they went all in on this idea uh, of people could be categorized in, in different levels. And that's, that's the narrative that our culture has taken. Now, science has come back around because uh, race, even the term race itself, it, it's a scientific term. Uh, it's a biological term. And the science field has come back and said, 
there, there is no such thing as race the way that it yeah. has been defined. That, that is a, it is a social construct that was created to, to give some people power and to take power away from others. Yeah. And that's the foundation. Now, the biblical narrative is totally different. Mm. Uh, the biblical narrative, I want to share this passage. Uh, this is really important. This is page one of our Bible. Uh, this is in Genesis 1, verse 26. It says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. Mm. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So what we just read is every human being, we all descend from Adam and Eve, and okay. every human being is born in the image of God and therefore has great dignity. All we can do is acknowledge that. There is no separation. There is one race, that is the human race. That is the yeah. biblical narrative. Yeah. And, and culture took a divert path, yeah, and and for some reason the church didn't catch it, yeah, and in many ways, and and some people throughout history they've taken verses out of the Bible and, and tried to twist them to to promote that no there can be you know some people are better than other people and a hierarchy and all of that. Uh, anytime somebody takes a verse of scripture and does that, by the way, it is out of context and that is a lie from the devil. Scripture does not teach that. In fact, Scripture teaches the opposite, that yeah. all men are created in, in the image of God. Uh, but that narrative is really important. And, and you and I were talking a little bit about Jesus shows up yeah. in a time and in a culture that, that was racist. Right. Uh, there was a lot of racism in the time of Jesus. That, that is not a new phenomenon. And it was racist against Samaritans, racist against Romans. Romans were racist against Jews. There was all of this racism going on. Yeah. And Jesus shows up. And, and he begins to just break down all these barriers and what he taught and what he did. And you, you mentioned a passage that, that yeah. you like to, to talk oh, about. Oh, man, I, you know, one of the most powerful passages that I tend to reference with this whole conversation of race is the Good, is the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And the story is just insane because we, we, we hear the story about this Jew that's been assaulted and mm -hmm. all of these things. And he's laying on the ground. He's beat up, bleeding, and what the story says is, and I'm just going to put it in my language, kind of 20, we in 2019, 2019 language, um, that a pastor rolls by, a priest, right, mm -hmm. and keeps walking, sees the man, but keeps walking, and then, I believe he's a Levite, a worshiper walks by, like a worship leader, so if we were to just say it, you know, um, Charles Stanley walks by, and Hillsong walks by, you know what I'm uh -huh. saying? Yeah. And then, and, and what's amazing about that, before I go to the last part, is that these two individuals are the ones that we would say would be the ones to first reach down because they are representing the faith. Yeah. But they walk past the Jew. And then a Samaritan walks up. And what's significant about the Samaritan and the Jew is that they had a race war going on. They did not play with each other. History would say, no, 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 we don't. Samaritans and Jews don't, blacks and whites don't, Hispanics and blacks, Asians and what they, we don't play because of culturally we don't do this. And he is the one, one who has the most to lose, that reaches down, picks him up. And not only does he pick him up, takes him down to an inn, a hotel, says, hey, whatever bill he wrapped, put it on me, comes back, checks. Like, he goes out of his way crosses over cultural boundaries, ignores the history, mm -hmm. ignores the things that he has learned from his ancestors about how he should treat this other race, mm -hmm. and he loves them as Jesus um, would want us to. And that, that, that's, that's what we have to do. And Jesus didn't just teach it. He models it. He models says it. In, the, in the Bible that Jesus, when he goes to Samaria, says he had to go through Samaria, yeah. uh, that Jesus had to break over that that because there was a division. It's, no, we don't interact with Samaritans. They're over there. He goes, he meets the woman at the well. Uh, entire village ends up putting their, their trust in, in Jesus. But he had to go there. He had to break down those barriers. He would go to the region of Decapolis where it was Gentiles and they were, <laughs> you know, eating bacon and all this stuff that was, you know, well, you can't associate with them. And Jesus would get in a boat. He crossed the Sea of Galilee and he, he would cross those, those cultural divides. He does yeah. that again and again. Uh, I want to share with you guys this passage. This is in Matthew 22. And, and it, it's talking about 
loyalty and money and all of that to the, the Roman Empire, but, but Jesus says something so brilliant I want us to catch here. Matthew 22, starting in verse 15, says, Then the Pharisees, these were religious leaders at the time, went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him, going to Jesus, along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said. And, and listen, because they're about to butter up Jesus, because they're, they're going to try and set him up and then, and then trick him with this question, knock him down. Right. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others <laughs> because you pay no attention to who they are. They go, Jesus, you treat everybody the same. <laughs> Jesus would talk to women. He would talk to Samaritans. Yeah. He, would talk to, he would cross all those boundaries. He would talk to those who were incredibly wealthy. He would talk to those who were incredibly poor. He would talk to beggars. He would talk to leaders in the community. Uh, he, he would talk to everybody. He didn't care who they were, what their status was, what, what box they would check off to say, this is who, who I am. And they're acknowledging that. They're going, you pay, you pay no attention to who they are. And then they, they say this, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Because they know if he says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, all the Jewish people are going to be upset with him. If he says right. don't, then all the Romans are going to be like, this guy's telling us not to pay taxes, telling us people. So they were going to get people divided against Jesus regardless. Yeah. So that's, that's the big setup. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? And then immediately, he's, he's already prepared for it. He says, show me the coin used for paying the tax. So I have here, uh, it's going to be impossible for you guys to see, but I have here the coin that, that would have been used at that time. Uh, you can confirm for me. This is a denarius from Rome. Actually, this is a wow. replica. I got it on Etsy. What are you doing? Um, <laughs> Why are you? But Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus says, bring me, bring me the coin. And, and so they, they bring him this denarius. He says, show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? And on here, there's a little tiny picture, just like our coins. We have a face of somebody, and it was Caesar, and it was, it was his name that was inscribed on the coin. And so they replied, Caesar's, they replied, verse 21. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. And then he says this, and to God's, what is God's? Mm. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and they went away. So the question that Jesus implies is, so whose image, who's carrying this image of God? If, if Caesar's image is on the coin, give that to Caesar. But he says, give to God what is God's. On every human being, every male, every female, every ethnicity is the image of God. We read that. That's the narrative we live in. That is the narrative of the scripture. That is the narrative of Genesis 1 that all men are created in the image of God, all women are created in the image of God, and Jesus says, give to God what is God's. Mm -hmm. And he brings it back to, yeah, Jesus, you're, like, you don't care who anybody is, and he brings it back to all of us are bearers of the image of God. Yeah. And, and this is so important for us as Jesus followers to understand that reality. That leaves zero room for any kind of racism. That leaves zero room for prejudice. Prejudice, by the way, is to prejudge where you look at somebody and you check off one box based on their appearance, and because of that one box you checked off, you then check off all other boxes for that person. That is called prejudice, that is called prejudging, and, and Jesus doesn't do that. He treats every individual as an individual. He doesn't assume about the individual. And, and so that's where the church can realign understanding the narrative we live in yeah. and, and to, get this, to get this right. Wow, you're preaching. I'm preaching now. Yeah, I love it. I got another verse, and then we're going to okay. talk about what we do with this. <laughs> Wait, can I just ask yeah, you? please. When did you find the time to get this? Yeah. I actually, I have an assistant, and she, uh, okay. she, she was looking was all like, over the internet, and really, she, she found that on, on Etsy. You love, to, you love preaching. Yeah. All right, here we go. So, <laughs> Paul, who's the apostle, follower of Jesus, one of uh, the authors of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit moved Paul to write. A lot of our New Testament is written by Paul. He's writing a letter to the church in Galatia. And in Galatians 3, uh, he, he really breaks it down in case there's any question on this. He says in verse 26, he says, So in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed 
and heirs according to the promise. Jesus breaks down. He says there, there's no socioeconomic division. There's no ethnicity division. There's no gender division. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And, and he just makes that crystal clear to a church that had some racial divisions and had some, yeah. hey, how do we all get along? And, and do we need to kind of do church separately and, 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 and kind of figure out our mm -hmm. own pockets of community? Paul's writing to him going, no, there is no division. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus levels the playing field. There is, nobody's better than the other. And by the way, as Christians, our job is to consider everybody better than ourselves. Wow. That, that we are to lift everybody else on a pedestal. People you know, people you don't know. As a Christian, our job is to humbly submit ourselves and go, I'm gonna consider others better than myself and I'm gonna treat everybody with dignity and, and with honor. Yeah. And I, th I think what's most important about everything you're saying is the question, if that is the case, mm -hmm. then why don't we do it? Mm -hmm. If we understand that Jesus has instructed us and the scriptures have clearly instructed, instructed us to be one family, mm -hmm. why do we still hold on to the things that separate us? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's a tension we have to wrestle with and in, in Romans, Paul talks about one of the reasons why we continue to do it, even though we know we shouldn't do it, and it's because we've not renewed our minds in that area. Mm -hmm. this, this area of race in our country, of why we continue, and I think, I don't know if I want to speak for the room, but I think I can speak for the country when I say we all feel the tension in America around this issue. It's like, why is this still happening in the South? Why, is, why are we arguing about something on Facebook? How is this doing this and you shouldn't do it? How do we find ourselves back in here? What we, what we continue to see, and these are even Christians mm -hmm. that are doing this, what, what we continue to see are individuals that have let themselves be conformed into the image of the world yep. as opposed to the image of Christ. And what we have to do if we're going to get this right is let God's word and his love invade every single area of us that we're still holding on to that may have come from our historical narrative, that may have come from a bad experience that we've had, that may have come from uh, a situation in which we created this thing. As I told you before, before I got my first white friend and started understanding that they love Mexican food and that they couldn't dance as well, because there are some white people that can get down, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> before I got in proximity, I bought into a narrative. Mm -hmm. And what God challenged me to do one day is to see people how he saw them, which meant that I had to become the Samaritan in the story and go first, while some people would say, no, you as an African-American, you as a black man, you don't have to go first. White people need to go first. And really, I would say, as Christians, we all need to go first. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to take the lead on this, whether you're white or whether you're black. T.D. Jakes says it like this when he talks about race. He says, black people don't think white people want to come to the party and white people don't think they're invited. And he's saying, at the end of the day, you're invited. Every, Jesus is saying we're all invited. Into, Hispanics, Asians, Indians, uh, black, we're all invited to the party to solve this problem. Yeah. And the, and the reality is for, for us as, as the church, this, this problem doesn't get better by us sitting back passively, uh, but by actively taking a step and, and leaning in maybe where we're uncomfortable. We got to, to hit these real quick, but I do want to, we were talking about what are, what are four things that we yeah. can do. Yeah. Uh, to, to help in this area. Uh, first thing is we can get intentional about doing life with people who are different than ourselves. Uh, we can get intentional about crossing over some of those cultural right. boundaries and, and go, whether it's in the church, uh, we have incredible diversity in our church. And, and it could be that there's people in our church that you've been near, you've you know, had conversation with or whatever, or you, you've maybe just kind of gone your separate way to engage with people in our church who have different ethnicities, uh, who have different cultures and all that, and to embrace the beauty of that. And that's so huge because one of the things as I've been doing this work around the country that we found is you, it doesn't matter how much you read mm -hmm. or how many conversations you have, until you start doing life with someone, uh, un until someone moves from being an idea to a person that you know that you are involved with, 
um, it's very difficult to understand and to break down those historical narratives that we've bought into knowingly or, or, or unknowingly. When I get a white friend, things change. When my white friends get a black friend, things change. When I get a Hispanic friend, I don't look at the issues anymore. It's not just, oh, that's an immigration law, or it's not just, oh, that's discrimination, or it's not just, oh, that's the flag. It, it, it changes, and it's yeah. like, no, 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 that's impacting my brother. And so now how do I lean in and have that combo? That's good. Second thing is to let God's love for all ethnicities invade every area of our hearts. Uh, that God wow. is a creative God, that diversity, um, it, it's not a problem. Uh, diversity is part of the plan. Yeah. And, and that in Revelation, it says that there's going to be every tribe, every tongue, every nation. If you don't like diversity, you're going to hate heaven. Uh, because that's, that's, that's where this is, is headed, and that's what we see in Scripture. And this part is so big because, and, I, and I'll say this, if, and this is what I say often, this is what, we're talking about prejudice again, mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to see racism. If you will let your son or your daughter be friends with someone from the opposite race, but you won't let them date them or marry them, you got a problem. Because, and, and now it starts to get real. It's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not. But wait, wait, you, you're getting ready to do what? Mm -hmm. And that's where we see racism show up a lot today. I like so-and-so, but do you want to build a life with them? Mm -hmm. And I get the idea of if you're not attracted to them, I'm not asking you to be attracted to somebody you're not attracted to. But if the reason you don't want your son or your daughter or even yourself to be associated or to be in love or with the opposite, with, with another person because, is because of their race, we got to be real about that and know that that's rooted in prejudice yeah. and in racism because it's saying, no, they're not good enough because of the color of their skin. Yeah. My mom said the same thing. And you, I told you about this. I started mm -hmm. dating a white girl. I said, mom, how would you feel if I brought a white girl home? She said, is that your first choice? I said, mother. <laughs> and then my dad ran through the door and said, Sam, you love whoever you love, no matter what color they are. Yeah. So it's on all sides. So, yeah. <laughs> Two more real quick here. <laughs> Uh, number three is uh, learn to listen and listen to learn. Mm. Uh, one of the best ways we can, we can love people is with our ears, uh, listening, and not, not just being so quick to speak, but uh, actually getting to know somebody. Yeah. Many times in this conversation um, or in these types of conversations, when you actually get people from the opposite races and all races around the table that don't really know each other, a lot of times we walk in with our filters ready to tell you, the other person mm -hmm. about, well, you don't see it from my way and we're listening so that we can respond mm -hmm. as opposed to listening to actually learn. And that means approaching the conversation with the idea that I, that I may have something in me that isn't right. Mm -hmm. If we come into the conversation going, what are you going to teach me? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, hey, I want to learn. Uh, right now, my new project is understanding the Hispanic culture. That's my new project. Every time I get around someone from the Hispanic culture, I'm going to teach me about your coach, teach me about your way. I want to know, and I genuinely am listening to learn, mm -hmm. not to respond. Yeah, and we would all be way better off doing yeah. that exact same approach and, and being interested in people because people are interesting and, and culture is interesting. And if you're like, I don't know how to do that, go on a mission trip. Uh, go on one of our SV mission trips. I just got back. I was in Nicaragua with my son last week. And it was incredible because <laughs> he's seeing new culture and learning new things and eating foods. Yeah. And, under, and it was this beautiful picture of, of him beginning to understand that God has created our world with a ton of great diversity. So uh, that's one step. And I want to close on, on this. Yeah. Um, use your voice to fight for those without a voice. All of us have a voice yeah. uh, to some degree or another. Use your voice to fight for those without a voice. That's what it means to be the church, to stand up uh, for those who are marginalized, those who, who are oppressed. And, and that's not just a, a good idea. That is our responsibility as the church, uh, to use the voice that God has given us to stand up for those who have need, whether that's a racial thing, whether that's a socioeconomic thing, whether yeah. that's a gender thing, whatever that may be, uh, that, that we use whatever influence God has given us uh, to help humanity around us, to receive the love Jesus has given us and, and to give it away to others. We're, uh, we're wrapped up on, on time here, Sam, but I wanna ask that, uh, first, thanks for joining us. Thanks yeah. for being a part of this conversation. Uh, yeah, would you thank Sam? <laughs> And uh, Sam, I'm going to ask that you would pray for us, pray for our church, and, for sure. uh, and, and close us out. Can we go a little old school? I know you, you may not go to church. This may be your first time. You'll be like, I don't want to touch the person next to me. But this is a black church, church tradition. I love it. Let's Can you it. grab somebody's hand next to you? Yeah. I know you're like, what? And hopefully they wash their hands. Get a little hand sanding <laughs> on the way out. 
Let's pray together. God, with our hands together at every single campus, we pray that you would make this picture a reality in our country. That every race, every tongue, every tribe, every nation would learn to love each other as you've called us to. God, invade our souls, invade our hearts. Show us the areas in which we are prejudiced that maybe got passed down that we never looked into. Give us the courage to make the changes we need to make for the sake of the kingdom. Even if that means us trading our own cultural ideologies for the culture of the kingdom. God, we love you. We thank you so much for this moment. We want to be a part of the change. We want to see your kingdom come in a new way in this area specifically. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.